All righty, cool. So, um, yeah, we were just at that talking about the blood flow restriction, how to kind of use that in there. And then I find that is a good um, way to talk about how to integrate them back into, I guess, training and feeling part of a team, keeping them engaged in, in the rehab process because it's pretty bloody hard if, it, if anyone has done it before. It's really hard. So for a lot of athletes, this early phase ACL rehab can feel like they're kind of fluffing around, not really working really hard. So I really like the idea of this using something like blood flow restriction or restricting, like increasing your tempos like crazy. So that way you're building up that metabolic stress to make these competitive people because quite often it'll be an athlete who's done an ACL make them actually feel like they're training. So anyone have any uh, kind of big tips on, you know, making the person engage with this process at this stage, um, dealing with that kind of psychosocial side, keeping them part of the team, any of that type of stuff? We'll start yeah, for, yeah for, for me, I think a, a great way you can do it is, is to get them in the gym doing their rehab at the same time that the rest of the squad's also in the gym training. And then they're sort of like in that same environment, you know, the the, the healthy squad are getting around the guy working and like giving him support. And, you know, like it, I think that's a great way to make them feel like they're working at the same time as the team. And then in terms of up on field, like often I find the head coach tells the, the athletes, to, you know, to sort of stay away a little bit from the field for a while, just mentally refresh. Don't worry about being up there. And then, you know, with the, it might be the rugby ball, the soccer ball, whatever athlete they are but like just when that's so far away actually being there and, and being able to do those things again it's often better to just have a little bit of time away originally but i think getting in the gym with with the people at the same time the rest of the squad's training and everyone's training together uh, i think that's a good way to, to go about it i've found cool and then like hitting having them aim for another big goal like an upper upper goal or something like that that they can mm. be integrated in with the team with some normal training and then some kind of rehab stuff. Yeah, that's a great idea. No. Cool. And Kurt, just apologize. He had to, the soccer's um, culture day actually got brought forward to 9.30. So he was going to be uh, give us some golden tips <laughs> on this, but we'll uh, hopefully we should cover as much as we can anyway from that. Um, so I reckon that early stage is pretty good. The next big thing, unless you have anything else to cover, the next big thing is kind of, getting someone back to that kind of return to run, return to kind of train um, phase, actually starting to integrate them into into the team. So, that, yeah, return to run. What are, what are kind of your variables there? How are we getting back gait and, and kind of progressing it towards sprinting? Yeah, it's a, it's a really important question. And um, I, I find it's one that physios – generally aren't as as skilled in as that, you know, that earlier stage rehab. They, they kind of just think about, you know, the, the typical physio response I've seen is they go, okay, we've, we've done a bit of quad strengthening, done a bit of hamstring strengthening, um, you know, the knees got better range and not much swelling. Let's just go back to running now. But it's really important to, to do these exercises that help bridge the gap between your traditional gym exercises uh, that, where you're just working on quad and hammy strength and actually running. There's, a, there's some great things you can do in terms of, you know, plyometric prep and even even running drills. If you work on those two things for a period of, let's say, three or four weeks before you start running, I think it goes a really long way. So in terms of plyometric stuff, you know, you might have heard of the plyometric continuum before, but doing like a little bit of force absorption work where you might even just start with a, like a tall to short where you're up on your toes, coming down and then landing, just like getting a little bit of like impact loading through the knee is really, really important to see how it responds because that type of loading, that impact loading is completely different to any other loading that you do in your more traditional gym-based exercises. And it doesn't prepare you to run as well as giving the knee these little little impacts to get used to before they start running. So I think the, you know, plyometric continuum working on those early stages of tall to shorts and a bit of force absorption work is fantastic for this. And then, as I said, actually doing some um, more progressive uh, like a bit further along the plyometric continuum, but still early days doing some pogos like double leg and single leg pogos where you are working on the stretch shortening cycle and getting that repeated impacts, just like the same sort of load it's going to get when the, you know, you're running those impacts through the knee and repeated impacts and just getting that stretch shortening going. And I think that's, that's really, really useful. If you can do some 
double leg pogos and single leg pogos and the knee handles it well without any swelling or anything like that, it's a very good sign that when they return back to running, they're not going to have any problems too. So I think I almost use it as a litmus test. If someone can do single leg pogos for, you know, 30 seconds and do a few sets of that and, and pull up really well and go fine, that person's going to be in a pretty good position to, to return back to running. So that's, that's more the plyometric side of things. And then, as I said, also using running drills to prepare someone to run is um, it's common sense for some, but not for, for others. Like if you want to get someone back to running, why not break down the task and, and build it up slowly? Like, so you can start with like a wall drill where you're leaning against the wall and just practicing that sort of running position and then working into an, an A walk. So you're doing those positions walking and then you're doing it marching and then you're doing it like as a proper A skip and it just builds up the impact load, gets the person used to some of the joint angles they have when they're running and Look, if you can do those two things, like work on some pliers and work on some running drills and do that for three or four weeks before they run, you, you, you're killing it. You're in the top 5% of, of, you know, physios preparing people for, for, for running, returning to running. So that's that'd be my hot tips there. Cool. I, I might plug myself here and say that hopefully on on uh, I'll get that blog up soon for you on <laughs> this exact thing on that rehab uh kind of plyometrics continuum and I'll have some videos yeah, look, to share for that. So that'll be good. But yeah, very much so that's, um, yeah, I 100% agree. All that stuff, um, super, super important. Um, and it shows your confidence. Like it's nothing worse than sending someone out to run and then they start to get this massive kind yeah. of hole because they're just not confident on throwing it on that leg. And then you've mentally set them back a long way. So if you can show them, you know, through plyometrics, through some return to running, they should almost know that they're going to be able to yeah. run before they do. That's exactly right. It shouldn't be this big mental jump in their head. Like if they've built up to it doing like A skips and little like even high knees on the spot gently and things like that, like you, you're telling them you pretty much are running. Like you, yeah. you're already doing it. You, you help give them some confidence there and then they just start moving, start making it move. And it it's, it's normally goes really well doing that. And thoughts on, I'm pretty sure the, like the Randall Cooper, the Melbourne ACL protocol, it's about 70% kind of leg symmetry indexes and like 70% max strength. Yeah. Kind of the, the aim in, in a lot of these both compound and isolated movements is the aim for that return to run area. Yeah. Yeah. There was a review um, on this round board 2018 um, where they looked at criteria for return to run. And the funny thing is they found in, in the review that, most papers did not use any like objective criteria. They just said, all right, three months, we're good to go. That's yeah. a huge takeaway. Like it's, it's things aren't, things should not only be time-based and I'm not saying to not use time. Like, you know, I'm not going to return someone back to, you know, to sport at six months post-op if they're killing all their objective markers. Time is still important, but the most important thing to know is it's not the only thing you use. You need to use it alongside objective criteria. So um, yeah, look, like you said, um, 70% uh, quad and hamstring strength on your limb symmetry index is what that review found. But I mean, me personally, if someone can do those plyos and those running drills, even if they're at like 60, 65, I'm not going to stop them because I find that they, they don't have as big a in, like, correlation between how well someone returns to run as their, their ability on those plyometrics and, and, and their running drills are personally. That's sort of what I've found. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I get, and, and you're going to talk that, I guess that dynamic system theory, as we see, this probably gets important further down the track um, where you really do want those numbers like to be like later on down the track where it's going to be like 90 odd percent, you know, close to a hundred percent. That's mm. where you really do want those numbers there because compensations later on, the body will just find a way to do it. And as long as it looks nice and everything, I'm, I'm happy with that. But we have to also as physios know that okay, if they're, if they're not getting it out of their quads or ha they're, they're getting it from other, their, their calf complex or their uh, glutes, something like that is kind of taking up a bit more of the slack there. Um, so, yeah, yeah the body will, the body's awesome. It'll organise itself to complete the task. And as long as it looks nice, I'm, I'm happy with it until right down the end is where I get a bit more pedantic. Um, yeah. Making sure that, you know, I agree. by that dynamic systems theory that it's kind of everything is, able to tolerate what it, whatever we're going to put it through but when it's low chaos it's it's low risk as well i think that's exactly right mate and i, I was just going to say that 
it's also um, preparing the tissues for higher speed running is, is more important. Like if you're trying to get someone to, to run at a high speed and their hamstrings are still at 60, 70%, that's when you're going to run into problems. So for a really low speed first return to run, strength isn't as important, but you want the tissues to be strong enough to handle the higher speed running stuff. And that's where the percentages factor in more and more. Cool. Anything there, Connor? No, the only question I would have would be how soon can you start your pogos and things like that? Is it as, and your, your total shorts and things like that? Is it just as soon as the knee's quiet, as soon as, are there any other criteria that you're looking for before you can start those things? Yeah, good question. Um, like I, my goal is to try to start it for three or four weeks before I'm trying to get them back to returning to running. So um, I think as soon as the knee is pretty quiet and you've obviously got a little base level of strength going, I like to just do these things like these taller shorts and these little run drills as a test, see how they pull up. And if they pull up really well and they go good, that's sort of the green light to continue. So whenever, whenever you first try something, you might not know the perfect time to start it, but you, you do a small dose of it, you do it as a test. And if they pull up sweet, then that's a good sign that you can progress these things so it's almost that, that this is where the art comes into it a little bit more it's not always like okay it's two months i can do this you've got to try things sometimes just be smart about it don't do anything stupid the first time do it at a low dose low volume and then see how they pull up and then you can progress from there so that's my general approach with things great that, cool that suits really what we've talked about in every other kind of lead up podcast this all of the all of the yep. initial ones is like some people really like to think that they can predict these things and predict, but realistically, we're just going to adapt to whatever. And you just have to be able to be really good at assessing and going, is this a positive adaptation and we're good to go? Or did they adapt ne negatively? And then I got to play with other training variables again to find their starting point, to find their entry point that they do finally adapt to. And then we can build from there. So I think that yeah. it shows that, that constant communication and assessment of whatever your outcome, whether it's a quiet knee or whatever it is at that stage or the person's confidence with the task that you were getting them to do. Um, and you just got to assess that and go. Um, so how about going in towards, yeah, those higher level, um, you know, returning to say sprinting, returning to changing direction, um, maybe some like integrating back into training. What's, uh, what's your go-to with programming around that? That's a massive question. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> just, put, just putting it out there. <laughs> just mid and late stage, all in one. No, I'm just good luck. Good. I can give you a good foundation of what I like to what I like to do from mid to late stage. So, just like anything, I think if you know good regressions and progressions for for whatever movement skill you're working on, then you you know you're really set as a physio. So to talk about change of direction and agility. I, I even like to start lateral movement progressions it's like super early during the rehab pro process. You don't, you don't need to wait until someone has, you know, run and, and, and run up to 80% or so in a straight line before you start any lateral movement at all. Like, I think that's a bit of a, a myth that sometimes people, they go, okay, now you've got to nail straight line before you do any change of direction. But I find that you can just really regress back that the change of direction movements and, and literally start someone on, on something like a, a state, you know, a static lateral lunge at the two to three month mark post surgery, and you're just starting to get reps in, reps in, and a lateral movement and pushing back, pushing back, exactly the type of thing they're going to have to do when they do a sidestep or when they do a lateral shuffle on field. And you can start that stuff super early. You might start with a static lat lateral lunge, then move into a dynamic one where you actually step into it and push back, and then that might turn into like a leap and land laterally, and then like a lateral rebound where you leap to the side and rebound back and doing that and progressing that over a couple of months, you're pretty much preparing someone for that change of direction type, type movement. And so I think it's just super important to understand that the more reps you can get in early in a safe, controlled way, and as, as we spoke about earlier, control the tempo, control the range to make it favorable for the person at the time, mm -hmm. but get reps in, get build confidence in those movement patterns and then build it up and up. And then when they return back to on field doing this stuff at, higher speeds they, they've already gotten in hundreds of reps of this type of thing and they're just much more proficient at it and much more confident at it too so that's that's what how i like to think about change of direction I and then once you get on yeah oh, sorry, go on. no no you, you go mate it's all good i was gonna say i reckon with with change of direction as well a big thing i see people mistake is gait is also a continuum the whole way from walking up to sprinting you know what i mean so 
Mm. You're just finding if, like where they're at with your testing that you've done, that like dynamical systems, you go, okay, you know, their quads, whatever, uh, 80%, what it, you know, they could handle X speed. So, you know, maybe at even 50, 60, might have them just doing some walking, walking back forward, like, you know, we're walking, they're mirroring someone walk, yep. walk back forward, walk yep. laterally. They might be doing yep. some games where they're playing with the ball and not thinking about their knee, but doing some walking, change of direction. And it's just building up your volume, your intensity, your mm. frequency mm. that matches mm. whatever your assessment has kind of shown that they're up to, I, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. So like once, once you're sort of happy that, that they can perform that movement well, then it's just a matter of, progressing the speed that they do it at and the the complexity and the you know the whether there it's a chaotic or a controlled environment so to take like a sidestep for example just like you said you can get someone to do like a walking wire drill um you can literally get them to do that at like three months post post stop you can they can walk in and then pretend to do a little sidestep at, at slow speeds and then the goal for you is to gradually build up the speed they do that up and then build up the you know, the, the chaotic nature of the environment. So you might make it more reactive where they just react to you pointing one way and then you might progress it to you actually run forward to meet them and then you move one way. So they're reacting to a moving target rather than just pointing one direction. Then it might be a se doing a series of them. So you might set up, you know, a series of cones, whereas like blue or red is an option and they've got to do like three side steps in a row. So it's just adding complexity, adding speed, adding more reactive elements to it. And doing that, you know, over a period of, of several months to, to try and have them meet their, their goal of whenever they're trying to get back to return to play. But yeah, like it's it's all just common sense progressions and, and regressions. And if, I think that's a huge takeaway for this with, with ACL rehab. If you can work from the end in mind and know what the person needs to get back to being able to do and then have regressions along the whole continuum, then you just gradually work them along that and get them more confident in each step of, of all these different movements you want them to be able to do. And, and, and then that's, that's, that's in essence, how to summarize my answer to your question. Like yeah. mid to late stage rehab is work with the end goal in mind and how do you regress them back and work them through a series of steps to, to tick off that movement competency in, in the environment they're going to need to do in, in sport. That's and what that's, it's all about. The, the thing that just, I was thinking right then is um, the, the thing that I want to make sure that people don't get wrong from um, that, that answer. What I was saying as well would be, Basically, the, to me anyway, and correct me if you think differently, but I think the only way you could really get that wrong is if you put someone in a task that was like too advanced for them, but kind of kept plugging away at it until they did it because they might eventually be able to get that task and not, you know, nothing bad really happens, but then they're done it in a way their body wasn't kind of you know all their system mm -hmm. isn't ready for they're going to organize all these compensations that then you're going to so you don't want to bring them into that high intensity chaos too early they might get through it they might not if they do get through it well then they're going to have got through it using different strategies to what you're actually trying to yeah. trying to train and adapt and then you got this bit of a shit storm later that you bad actually habits. have to untrain yeah bad habits that you have to untrain yep Yep, completely agree, mate, 100%. Cool. Any particular, like, testing in that kind of mid to late stage that you really kind of hang your hat on? Yeah, well, for, for me, like, the biggest goal of, of, of that mid to late stage area is just building strength and power. Like, that's what it's all about. And then, obviously, your return to run and return to, to change your direction progressions are happening too. So, like, they're, they're the big things I look at. So... In terms of in terms of um, strength testing, this is where you can start to do stuff that you know the knee might not have liked to do earlier on. So, um, in terms of hamstrings, if you have a Nord board, that's fantastic. I found it super useful um, to really show up differences between sides. You know, you, you might you might try like single leg hamstring bridges and things like that, but the body, as you mentioned before, is brilliant at compensating. You might just use the, the glutes might just help out a little bit more to get get your reps out on that, and it's. It's just not the same. Unfortunately, I've found there's really not much of a substitute for a direct hamstring strength test like a Nord, like a Nordic on a Nord board. Or if you have a leg curl, even even a leg curl, I've found is, is super useful to, to test the hamstrings a lot more so than like a hamstring bridge where it really is a bit more of a compound type lift. So that's mm -hmm. what I go to for, for hammy. So yeah, I'd go, if you, do, if you um, have a Nord board, great. 
most people don't. If you have a leg curl, great. Still, some people might not. If you don't have either of those, then you know you're going to have to probably revert back to more more of a hamstring bridge type movement to get a goal, or a handheld dyno if you have that too. So it just really depends what you have available. Um, then the same sort of principle for quads. Like I've found it's really interesting. A lot of people like to use leg press, but again, in my experience, I've found people compensate on it. They use a ductor more, they use glute more, and and you get them doing that. Oh yeah, it feels dead even. Then you get them on like a single leg leg extension. And there's like a 20% difference between sides. And you're like, okay, we know that a leg extension is only quad. We know mm -hmm. that a leg press can be quad, uh, ductor, glute. And so you know that something's compensating there. So I, I really like a single leg leg extension, um, you know, for, for reps. And I, it's not the type of thing I do a 1RM of. It's not the type of exercise you would do a 1RM with. But I tend to try to find a weight that someone can bang out between sort of four to eight reps um, so that it's still in that sort of strength zone. Um, and, and look at the difference between sides there. And I, I found that's a, just as sensitive as the Nordic is for hammies, the, the leg extension is for quads. And, and same again, if you don't have that, you should hopefully have a handheld dynamometer. If you don't have that, a weighted single leg squat for reps is, is probably your next best, best, you know, best thing you can do there. So that's, that's how I like to measure strength in, in that mid to late stage. And this mid to late stage we're talking about, this is like three months of like training, basically. It is 12 yeah. plus. Yeah, it's like because what like while well, the research has shown us what it's around nine months. You really don't want to be returning someone who's had a surgery before nine months where possible, do you? So, I mean, you, you mm. do have this good time to run at like, you know, almost using it like a a, a mini preseason or something is how I like to frame it to yep. to say, hey, you know, we're going to build your build your endurance capabilities, build your just capacity, and then progress it as we're going along more into that strength, more into that power, keep on touching on that capacity stuff. So it's not detraining, but kind of yep. just using this as a preseason to almost prepare you to be a better athlete than where you were. I completely agree, mate. It, you're that mid to late stage ACL rehab. You should almost like walk into the gym. And if you saw someone, you, you should not be able to know if they're an ACL rehab client or just someone doing S and C. Like it should look like that. That's how you sort of know if you're if you're fiddling around doing little like little mini balance exercises and little like little isolated stuff in that mid to late stage, you know you're probably not getting the best rehab you can be getting. So it it really should just look like good progressive strength and conditioning in the in that sort of four four to nine month period, really. So it is like a an LTAD, like long term athletic development, or or like a preseason, you know, welded into a five to six month period. So yeah, completely agree. And your the understanding still it's at nine months is where that kind of risk is at the at the lowest from your understanding still. Yeah, so there's there's a paper that showed that between six and nine months uh, for every month you waited, so from six to seven, seven to eight, and eight to nine, it, it, it helps like reduce injuries by fifty percent for ACLs. So it's it, it does seem like there is something to time being important, and I think that's just simply to do with the graft taking fully in the knee. And the graph being as strong as you know, as strong as possible, because you can't hurry that up. No matter what you do, you can't just go, okay, I'll just I'll just do some more squats and that'll help it. The, the graft has to take and has to develop strength and, and 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 hold in the knee, and that just that is something that does just simply take time. So that's where that research is interesting. Between six and nine, um, there is, and I know the NRL guys get them back sometimes around six, seven, and eight. Um, I guess you just have to accept that there is an element of rolling the dice a little bit more then, but they're, they're in a situation that's completely unique. Like these players are worth, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to the club. And, and if the players on the field, it might affect, make a huge impact on the amount of money the club makes. So there's all these other factors that are involved there um, mm -hmm. that we don't really need to worry about for even, even sort of semi-pro levels, anything from there down, you shouldn't be, you know, compromising that nine month point in my opinion. Yep. Anything there, Connor? No, not at all. It's just, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I reckon the last thing, let's just chat from this kind of nine month, this return to perform, this kind of chaos, like what type of percentages, leg symmetry index on different things you're looking, what tests, what your programming is really looking like, if really you are involved at all or if they're just off doing their own thing and you're just checking in. So how does it kind of go there? Yeah, look, it's, um, I guess a, a takeaway from this is 
it, it really depends on who you're going to be working with throughout your ACL rehab process. Like I'm, I'm a bit unique in that. Like I, I love taking someone from A to Z the whole way through. And I, I feel very confident in doing that, but often you're going to be working, you know, with a, with a physio that might not be as good at that or, or have the facilities to do proper late stage rehab and return to play work with you. So it, it really depends on, on who you're working with. If, if you've got a physio and an SNC, it's super important that they're on board with each other and they're still working together. The, the general approach is that in the early days, it's going to be more physio and less SNC. And then as you progress along the rehab, it should be you know more SNC and less physio, but never 0% and 100%. You're always going to have them, them both around at different times. So like we spoke about earlier, even at the very beginning of, of an ACL rehab, you want your, your SNC there to help you with programming for your upper body and for your other leg. And then even at the very, very end of rehab, um, you still want the physio to be there to just be checking on the integrity of the graft. If the knee is, you know, knees handling all the load going through it, checking on any swelling and things like that, and just whether the actual joint is, is, is handling things well too. So it's never just completely one or the other. It's a big, big crossover. And so, you know, that's, that's going to, that's going to determine, you know, what sort of test you do with who, but mm -hmm. for me, like I, I, I'll talk to you about what I do with people and, you know, there's lots of different return to play tests that I, that I do, but the, from what the research shows, we're looking for, for above 90% quad and hamstring limb symmetry index. I would prefer a hundred. I, yeah. I don't know why you wouldn't, but yeah. the, the research hasn't shown a difference between, you know, and this hasn't been studied particularly well, so we can't really answer it, but the research hasn't really shown any, any lower, um, you know, any, any higher risk of injury. If you're below 90, that seems to be the cutoff point, but I still aim for a hundred on yeah. both of those things. Um, I then look at a bunch of hop tests too, as we, as we all know, um, there's single hop, triple hop, crossover hop, but the other two that are really important are, um, medial, medial triple hop, um, which is an interesting one that is a bit of a newer one. So you, you're facing sideways and you're doing three hops across your body, still facing the same direction. Mm -hmm. And then you see how far you can get and stick it. And then also, um, a 90 degree medial rotation hop. So you start facing sideways, you just hop and land facing you know 90 degrees to where you were facing before so it's like you just do a little spin in the air and then you end up land landing facing forward and mm -hmm. those two are super important to include because the research has shown that those two that are a bit more lateral focused a bit more rotational focused they discriminate between people who've had an acl versus having a, a lot better than the forwards hops which makes sense like the knees most challenged during lateral and rotational movements so why not test it in your hop test doing those more, you know, plane specific um, tests too. So I, I wouldn't just stick to your traditional three forward ones that everyone does. I would be adding in the medial triple hop and the, and the 90 degree rotational hop too. Um, and then other things to look at that, you know, aren't, aren't as often done, but things that need to be spoken about are like, you need to try to get, like, let's say the athlete has some kind of conditioning test that they did before the injury and, and you have a baseline, you want them to be back as, at as least the level they were before conditioning wise. Okay. Um, same for same for agility. If you're lucky enough that they have some kind of agility test data, or even if it's like a T test or something, trying to compare that to what it was before too. Um, other things that are also underrated are just psychosocial profiling too. So, um, you know, you can, you can do a re uh, return to sport index, um, psychological screen with an ACL client where they just go through and, and tick off how confident they are. And, and that in itself, like, the research has sort of shown that that correlates super well with their physical function. Funnily enough, if someone doesn't feel confident and ready, it's likely that there's something physically like a, there might be a reason behind that too. So that's, that's another thing that I, I like to look at as, as well. Um, but yeah, there's some of the key tests, so our, our limb symmetry index, hop tests, psychological tests, and then looking at any conditioning or agility um, scores that they had from before and seeing if they're back at a hundred percent there too. I know my favorite thing to do here is to like book them in for like a, an hour long appointment, or if that's your, the model, if you're an appointment booking or if you're in with the team, I want to spend a whole hour and I want to do the tests fresh. And then I want to get them through either like one of their performance, like a 1.2 K something like that, and then get them and test them again under that fatigued, um, kind of mm. area as well um and kind of compare 
if limb symmetry indexes stay the same, like usually there's a drop in performance, like five to 10%, but I'm just looking more so for the limb symmetry indexes to stay the same or very, very similar anyway, yeah. under fatigue and under, and that's, I still haven't decided yet whether that's like a, do I hold them back from at least performance training or whatnot, or if that's just a, you know, maybe we just get them to do less, uh, you know, less volumes of performance training or whatnot. I haven't really kind of got that far in my uh, reasoning to be solid yet, um, but that's definitely something that I like to do as a as a measure myself there. Do you have any kind of thoughts mm. or reasoning around that? No, that, that's a good point. That's something that I didn't add, and, and it's something that very few people do is, is t doing these same sort of tests, like your hop test and your strength test in a fatigue state, because what's what can happen is under fatigue that you can see a bigger difference in between sides than when, when fresh. And obviously when they're returning back to sport, they're going to be under fatigue and you don't want things to deteriorate on the, on the affected side more um, under fatigue compared to the other side, because then you're just going to be a, at a heightened risk of injury. So I think that's a, I think that's a great, great suggestion, mate. Um, I would just take it. If someone does show a bigger difference under fatigue than when fresh, I would just take it as it means that we still got to just keep working on integration into training for a bit longer, just being a bit slower at building up what they're doing at training and just to get more capacity work in there at training, just simply getting more volume of running, all that thing, all those things ticked off before you go, okay, boom, you're unrestricted completely now at training. That's, that's how I would take it. It's just, let's just, let's just not pull you back from doing things like, okay, you can't do that drill anymore, but let's perhaps just go a bit slower at integrating them back into training until those differences are, um, you know, normalized. That's, that's how I would go about it. Yep. So you kind of pro the programming, um, implication for that is you have them kind of, they're doing the full intensity tasks. You might be titrating up the volume. So, so you might hold back a bit of volume, titrate that up, but they might be doing some extra kind of rehab or just like extra, um, kind of strength or endurance focus or whatever work on top of that to, to make sure that you're kind of getting that capacity up or, or what? Yeah. So if they're not, if they're not getting enough, like if they're not getting enough out of what you're allowing them to do at training, then you need to do top ups. But if someone is like, let's say someone is three quarters integrated back into training, then there's going to be less top ups needed than someone who's only doing half of what's happening at training. If you know what I mean, yep. you definitely don't want them going, going backwards. If you, if you're like, okay, I'm only happy with you doing these three drills and there's like, you know, that's like a third of the training session. And if they only do that, they're going to probably go backwards a little bit in terms of their capacity. So yeah, you should, you should use top ups as needed, depending on how much they're doing at training. And I find that, you know, if there is that drop in drop off in limb symmetry index under fatigue, it just means that their capacity isn't quite there yet. So the more running you get them doing, the more top up so that you build them up to, you know, similar volumes of running as what everyone else is doing at training. Once they're at that point, I, I reckon you'd be far less likely to have a drop off in, in limb symmetry index under fatigue than it uh, when someone's only done like half the running volume that everyone else is doing. You would more likely to see it happening at that point. So, yeah. And should those sure. top ups be specific to the uh, to the intervent or to the task that you found that there has been a an issue with, or just general prep stuff? So for me, the way I use top-ups, it really depends on what are they getting from the drills that you have allowed them to do at training. So let's say the drills you're allowing them to do at training are really low change of direction, just a bit more straight line, skill work, not too much of that. Then, okay, I want my top-ups to be, you know, this agility stuff that we know is absolutely crucial for an ACL. But let's say that they're a bit further along the path and you're allowing them to do a bit more change of direction and agility type drills but it's just the total amount of running that you're not happy with them doing yet, then, then the top-ups you're going to do is like, okay, let's just do some, some a bit more straight line to top you up, but not, not as much as what the other guys are doing in the, in the total session, but no point doing more agility stuff then because you've just done a couple of small-sided games or something. So it really just is what are they getting from the drills you allow them to do at training, and then what, what do they still need to work on to be meeting all the things they're going to have to do in a full training session. And again, it's just about bridging the gap between those two things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no i like that and then anything with um specific say like if it's a say you found the quads just under fatigue there like would you give them get them to do some post 
post session like quad burners or something just to fatigue or anything like that or is that kind of pushing the capacity too much you think that you might get like a negative adaptation yeah like it really depends on it depends on um the limb symmetry index and, and when they're displaying that drop in strength if, if it's just even in fresh conditions their, their, their limb symmetry index is still like 85 90 I want to hammer them fresh and just get them as strong as possible, you know? But mm -hmm. if it's like, let's say it's 95, 100 fresh, and then it drops to 80% under fatigue, then I'm going to do their strength work under fatigue. Yeah, so it really just depends. Awesome. Make it make it specific to what you see. Yep. No, that's really good. That's kind of what I was thinking just to get out of uh, get out of that point there as well for people. It's that, that specificity principle kind of rings true there as well, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Anything you got to cover there, Connor? Uh, no, nothing. Just uh, kind of a kind of a wrap up question for me would be: How do you know that you rehab, and how do you know that everything you've done has been successful? Like, what is a successful return to play? I know it's a hard question to ask. Is it like six months without an injury, and that was just like another mm. freak accident, or when do you start to attribute that what you did wasn't enough? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a tricky one to answer. Um, I think if we look at it from a from a actually returning back to you know, your first game type situation, if look if the athlete sort of tells you things like, yeah, I wasn't really even thinking about my knee, and you know, post game there's there's no like there's no massive increase in pain or swelling or anything like they're just like, oh yeah, it's like a little bit sore, and that's normal because whenever you do something for the first time ever, that's standard practice. That there's you know there's going to be some kind of little response in the knee, but if the person tells you that like. Yeah, I felt great out there. I wasn't thinking about my knee. There's no real problems in the days after. And they just do that consecutively week after week. And, and they just like, you, you almost don't really hear from them. And they're just like enjoying themselves in that training. And they go a whole season with, with no problems. And like, that's, that's, that's your ideal situation. If, if someone goes back to sport and you can see that they're tentative, they're not performing well at all. Like the coach comes up to you and goes, yeah, like, you know, he's not the player he used to be. They're the sorts of things you don't want to be hearing. And that's that's maybe a sign that you haven't returned them back to performance. And that's the, that's the sort of the difference between return to play and return to performance is, um, you know, are, are they back at where they were? And if the coach is happy with them, the player's not thinking about it, they're not having any real symptoms and, and, they're, and they're, they're killing it out there. And then that happens for a whole full season. Like, I, I would say that's a successful return to sport. Um Obviously, with ACLs, we know that re-injury is a funny thing. Like, it's not – you can do everything perfectly, right, in an ACL rehab. And then, for example, they can have a, a, a contact injury and it's nothing you could have done about. So you can't, you can't, you know, judge yourself at all in that situation. But it's also important to remember there's certain patients out there that have these, these bio, biomechanical or anatomical risk factors in their knee that just mean that they are more predisposed to ACLs. And it may, it happens at the elite of the elite level, you know, how's the Swan, the Swans player, that Swan, I've forgotten his name, yeah, yeah, who's yeah. done his ACL, like, what is it, eight times or something yeah, absurd? Yeah, like, yeah. And you know he's getting the best rehab possible, right? It's at the Swans and he's still done it. So yeah. you can't, like, let's say someone, because I've had that happen with a couple of my guys, and one of them is a guy who's had, like, six surgeries on his knee. And, like, for him, unfortunately, clearly his knee just isn't isn't up to the task, unfortunately. Like, no matter what yeah. he's done, every different surgery hasn't worked out for him, all the rehab. So you just got to gotta be able to hold your, head, hold your head high and not be too high on yourself if there are certain people that where things are more out of, out of your control.